All righty, um, let's get rolling. So um, we will begin with uh, a conversation with Minister Wilkinson, but I'll share some opening thoughts first. Um, so welcome everyone to Climate Action Network Canada's webinar celebrating the fifth anniversary of the signing of the Paris Agreement. My name is Catherine Abreu, I'm the Executive Director at Climate Action Network Canada, uh, and I am joining you today from unceded Algonquin Anishinaabe territories in what is also known as Ottawa. Um, so a couple of housekeeping notes to begin with. First, there is interpretation available. So if you head to, if you're on Zoom and you head to the bottom of your screen and click on that interpretation link, you should be able to choose what language you'd prefer to hear our conversation in today. Um, unfortunately, this option is only available on Zoom. So for those of you who are watching us uh, over Facebook Live, you will not be able to make use of the translation. Um, we're still sorting out how to make translation widely available in the online context. Uh, we are going to be collecting and asking questions using Slido. So you can see the link in the Zoom chat uh, to head over to Slido and ask and upvote for questions that you like. And those of you, again, who are on Facebook Live should be able to access that same Slido link. So um, the Q&A function that is available here in the Zoom chat will not be uh, something that we're using to ask questions, although you can use that if you have any logistical um, issues that you want to uh, be dealt with. All right, so let's dive in. Um, we're celebrating the fifth anniversary of the Paris Agreement this Saturday, December 12th. And we're really doing this in the midst of unprecedented global disruption and hardship. But if there's anything that the COVID-19 pandemic has made clear from my perspective, it's that our health and well-being is inextricable from the health and well-being of the non-human world. Five years later, we're asking ourselves, is the Paris Agreement working? And that's kind of a tricky question. According to the UN Environment Program's 2019, 2020 emissions gap report, emissions grew by 2.6% last year in 2019, reaching a new record of 59.1 gigatons of uh, CO2 equivalent. And fully half of that 2.6% growth in emissions is attributable to massive wildfires that swept across many parts of the world in 2019. The emissions gap is yet as, as yet unaffected by COVID-19 while we will see global, global carbon dioxide emissions fall by about 7% this year. This will only contribute to significant emissions reductions by 2030 if countries pursue economic recovery plans that incorporate strong decarbonization objectives. However, there's some good news. A recent report from System IQ details the ways in which the Paris Agreement is fundamentally reshaping the global economy. Uh, in 2014, for instance, the IEA, the International Energy in agency forecast the average solar prices would reach five cents per kilowatt hour by 2050. And it only took six years, not 36, for that solar energy to reach that price. And that's just one of so many examples of the accelerated transition that we are seeing toward clean energy in the global economy. However, the emissions of the richest 1% of the global population account for more than twice the combined share of the poorest 50%. And that means that rich countries like Canada have our work cut out for us when it comes to upping the ante on tackling, on contributing our fair share to the global effort to tackle climate change. So here we are, we've organized this webinar today with three objectives in mind. We wanna reflect on the important, importance of transformational climate action that contributes to true um, working in partnership with indigenous peoples. And we wanna talk about how things have changed since 2015. In particular, we wanna want talk with you, Minister, about how Canada plans to exceed its 2030 target and link short-term action with commitment to reach net zero emissions by 2050. And we also wanna have a conversation about how the implementation of the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples is critical to climate justice. Today, we're gonna to learn from the Canadian government, the Assembly of First Nations and the UK High Commission on their plans to ramp up ambition in 2021 and how we can contribute to those plans, how we can work together building on what we've learned through the COVID-19 crisis about inequity and the need to address those inequities through climate action. 
Um, I'm so honored and, and privileged today to be joined by Minister Jonathan Wilkinson of Environment and Climate Change Canada, the UK High Commissioner to Canada, um, Susan Dalgershek, my apologies, I always feel intimidated pronouncing that last name, and of course, National Chief Perry Belgard from the Assembly of First Nations. Um, Minister, let's begin with you uh, with a few opening comments. Super. Well, listen, first of all, thank you uh, very much for inviting me to be here today. Um, certainly very happy to be here at the, uh, the uh, just before, I guess, the, uh, the eve of the fifth anniversary of the Paris Agreement. It, it seems like a long time ago, I think, for many of us, um, but I certainly remember it well. The, uh, the Trudeau government had been elected just beforehand, and I had been appointed at that point parliamentary secretary to Minister McKenna, who was... Uh, somebody who played a, a fairly important role in the context of the negotiation of the Paris Agreement and, and subsequent action that the, the federal government has taken. I, I think at, at that time it was pretty clear that the Canadian population as a whole was was really tired of inaction on climate change on the part of, of Canada. Uh, I think there was a real sense both at home and abroad that, that Canada had withdrawn from playing a constructive role on the international stage. And so one of our goals at Paris was to essentially say Canada's back at the table um, in, in trying to be a constructive player with respect to how we can, as an international community, come up with an architecture to help us to address the climate crisis. Um, and that agreement, uh, while certainly not perfect, and, and as you said, um, the ambition needs to increase, um, was a fundamental baseline for Canada and for others to really commence some of the, the heavy lifting to actually address uh, fundamentally some of the, the challenges that we have domestically. Um, you will know that, that it was really the catalyst for the development of the Pan-Canadian Framework on Climate Change and Clean Growth, um, which was you know, a big step forward for Canada. It was really the first real climate plan Canada has ever had with over 50 different initiatives from phasing out of coal to methane regulations to pricing on pollution and investments in public transit. Um, and it, it identified, as you know, about 225 megatons in reductions, not enough to get us to our 2030 target, but an enormous step forward. We were very clear that there would be more work that would need to be done. Um, but the Pan-Canadian framework was something that actually directly came out of the Paris Agreement. And, and I think that's an important acknowledgement of the importance of the Paris framework. We have continued to build on the work that, uh, that was done on the Pan-Canadian framework. You would have seen an announcement a few weeks ago by Minister McKenna about the Canada Infrastructure Bank, where a lot of the money there is being dedicated to projects that really fit within the green envelope, public transit funding, commercial building retrofit funding. Um, you would also have seen in the fall economic statement that Minister Freeland brought forward just a, a few weeks ago, a number of elements with respect to nature-based solutions and funding for that, funding for retrofits of homes. Um, trying to start to enable Canadians to actually have more agency to, st to address climate change themselves through some of the, the choices that they make in their lives. We, we though know, as, as, uh, as I said, that more ambition is required. Uh, I have been saying in the, the throne speech said that we will be bringing forward an enhanced climate plan uh, that will look to, uh, to exceed the, the current target. Um, that's not simple in a country like Canada and with only effectively nine years left. We will be bringing that forward very soon. Um, and of course, we will be consulting uh, with provinces, territories, indigenous peoples, and with Canadians generally, with respect to the federal proposal. We will also be looking for provinces and territories to raise their level of ambition with respect to things that operate within their sphere. I do think that um, the, the COVID-19 pandemic has kind of sharpened the focus for a lot of this. I think it has made us a lot more aware um, of a number of different things, including that change is possible. <laughs> Some of the things that we didn't think we could change, um, we found very quickly that we could. Um, and so I do think that there's... Donc, euh, je crois vraiment qu'il y a un momentum, un momentum qui se bâtit euh, fortement à l'international, en partie parce que euh, le capital international va vers les changements climatiques et je pense que ça a des implications fondamentales et... Euh, Je pense qu'avant, on aurait vu le premier de l'Alberta, jamais qu'on aurait vu ça déclarant des, change, des changements vers, pour le climat. Alors, je suis très optimiste pour les prochaines années et l'habilité non, non seulement d'atteindre 2030, mais aussi 2050. Et évidemment, le travail que vous 
And from an advocacy perspective in trying to push all of us to do more. And, uh, and so I just look forward to having a conversation with you today. And I'm very much looking forward to, uh, to, to bringing forward some of the things that I think will help us to get to where we need to go um, very soon. Thanks so much, Minister. So yeah, I mean, I was there in 2015. That was my first set of UN climate negotiations. And it was such an incredible experience to be in the room as the Paris Agreement was gaveled through thousands of people just weeping because it was such hard work to get to that point. But something that I said regularly after the signing of the Paris Agreement is those who think that this is an agreement that's going to solve all of our problems when it comes to climate change and get us right on track to reducing emissions are wrong. And on the flip side, those who think this agreement is totally insufficient are also wrong. Um, this is a, you know, a consensus-based document that almost 200 countries around the world came together on. And really what it comes down to is the domestic level implementation of the goals outlined in the Paris Agreement and how quickly we are able to scale up action in the near term to really drive down those emissions. Um, so can you give us a little more insight in Minister? So we did hear, as you said, in the speech from the throne um, that we can anticipate a plan to exceed our 2030 emissions goal uh, sometime in the near future. We, of course, got the tabling a couple of weeks ago of Bill C-12, um, an act regarding the accountability of reaching net zero. Can you give us a little more tidbits on, on what we can expect um, in the near future? Sure. Um, I mean, C-12, I, I think, is quite important um, uh, in the context of actually forcing transparency and accountability with respect to climate change on an ongoing basis for all governments going forward. Um, given where climate sits within the Canadian population, um, I, I think that there, I would hazard a guess that there are very few governments that will have the courage to, uh, to repeal that bill. And therefore, it will be a forcing function to ensure that, that governments are bringing forward credible plans, credible targets, and um, and uh, and are held accountable for by the Canadian public for uh, for what they do or do not do with respect to climate action. Um, but clearly, in the bill, we also have said we will be standing up an advisory panel um, to advise the uh, the government of Canada with respect to pathways to net zero. Um, that will be drawn from across the country, from across various sectors. It will include youth. It will include Indigenous peoples. Um, but it's actually trying to ensure that there is an outside body that will provide independent advice to the government. Um, and we'll be able to, to, to provide that advice publicly to, to the Canadian public. Um, the next piece, of course, is, is the Enhanced Climate Plan. Um, and I would tell you that in order for Canada to meet its 2030 and exceed its 2030 targets, and in order for us to be on a pathway to 2050, um, we have to target all major sources of emissions in this country. It's not like you can skip one. And so you, you've seen some elements on the building side, but we need to get at, at some of the building issues between now and 2050. We need to move towards net zero building codes um, so that new buildings are not a problem from an emissions perspective going forward. We need a fundamental transformation in terms of, of transportation. And that's not just zero emission vehicles or zero emission heavy duty vehicles. It's, it's also about urban design and public transit. Um, we need to, to look at waste, we need to look at industrial emissions and how we can actually help our, uh, our Canadian companies to be competitive in a low carbon world. That means they need to make investments about how they're actually going to use low carbon processes to produce products that people will want. And I think that's important in the context of international competition. And, and we also need to think about, about the effects that a transition and, and that, a, that a, you know, a move towards a much lower carbon economy is going to have. And we need to be thinking about how we provide supports and skills training for those people that may be impacted in the same way that we did with the, the, uh, the transition from coal-fired power. Um, and that's, uh, that's not just an industry specific, it's also, you know, reflecting on, in particular, you know, high levels of youth unemployment right now. And how can we ensure that we're thinking about uh, training programs in a way that's actually going to prepare them for the jobs of the future. And so we intend to bring that forward. And of course, the other piece of this, which um, you will know very well, it was very important to Paris and part of the bargain is international climate finance. I mean, helping develop, developing countries to adapt um, to mitigate climate emissions, but typically they're not the big problem in terms of greenhouse gas emissions. It's also about ad adapting to some of the effects of, uh, of climate change that by and large the industrial world has caused. 
Yeah, thanks, Minister. A lot there, and absolutely the case that we at Climate Action Network Canada and many of our members consider Canada's fair share of the global effort, not just to be the work we do here at home to drive our emissions down, but the support that we provide abroad to help other countries do the same while they continue to adapt to the impacts of climate change. Um, so looking forward to seeing that package of what we our new domestic plan is and what our new climate finance commitment is in the near future. Um, saw that call from Ban Ki-moon yesterday for Canada to really step up to the plate on our climate finance package, which is um, a welcome call. Uh, so yeah, again, Minister, great to hear you talk about the kind of just transition elements of it. We were very pleased to work with many of our members through the Just Transition Task Force for co-workers and communities. Um, I think that leads me to my last question for you, and then I'll ask a couple from our audience. Um, so, you know, I mentioned earlier that this report from System IQ is giving us a glimpse into the really dramatic changes we're seeing that's in the global economy being driven by the Paris Agreement. Um, in 2020, zero carbon solutions are competitive in sectors representing around 25% of global emissions. By 2030, we'll likely see that share grow to 70%. Uh, electric vehicles will likely beat internal combustion engines on sticker price before 2024. And if we set the right policies and invest wisely, the 2020s could see an increase of low carbon jobs by about 35 million. So when we're talking about this new climate plan, to what extent can we think about it as a bit of an industrial strategy as well? So you're talking about the growth of the low carbon economy, and that I think has seen some movement in the last few years in Canada. But we have also seen your government and other Canadian governments in the provinces and territories continue to invest in fossil fuels. Um, so to what extent can we anticipate that part of your planning to exceed 2030 will be a, an industrial strategy strategy that helps us grow the clean economy that we know we need for prosperity and jobs in the future as we move away from those fossil fuel investments? So a great question, um, and I'm glad you asked that question. Um, I think it absolutely has to be. Uh, my, my view, uh, my, my background is I, I spent the past almost 20 years as, as an executive in the clean technology industry, um, working on technologies that focused on reducing carbon emissions and, and one company that focused on clean water. Um, and, and I've always been of the view that this, this has to be an economic strategy as much as an environmental strategy. Um, and the transition towards uh, addressing greenhouse gas emissions has to be one that actually takes account of the opportunities, not, not just the threats. And so, you know, in Canada, we are blessed with many things that I think put us in a very advantageous position. If you think about you know, things like um, electric vehicles, you need all kinds of minerals. Canada is blessed with many minerals in order to produce batteries. You need to have the ability to actually manufacture. We have lots of manufacturing capacity to make the, uh, the, the, the cars. Uh, you know, we, we have technology to be able to do the refueling infrastructure and, and those kinds of things. Same thing with low carbon building products. I mean, Canada is, there's no country that is better placed to actually be developing a supply chain with respect to low carbon, energy efficient building products. There's a whole range of things. And so I think what you will see when we release uh, the updated climate plan is a document that is focused very much on, on um, industrial policy that is really about building a low carbon economy at the same time that we are very focused on reducing greenhouse gas emissions. And, and, uh, and look, Canada's not alone. I mean, Europe has been thinking about this. China has clearly been thinking about this. And our neighbors to the south are thinking about this very actively now with President-elect Biden. At the end of the day, Canada, if it wants to be not only a leader on reducing emissions, but also wants to still be a prosperous country where young people have an opportunity to get a job, build a life, um, buy a home, uh, you know, um, we, we need to be thinking about the economic side of it because this ultimately is going to be a competition um, and, uh, and Canada can't afford to be left behind. Thanks, Minister. Okay, one more question for you and then we'll uh, move on to High Commissioner. Um, so the overwhelming amount of questions in our Slido for you is really about these investments in fossil fuels. We did see a commitment from the Canadian government in the pan-Canadian framework to phase out subsidies to fossil fuels, uh, and you continue to, to make those commitments through the G7 and G20. Um, how are we going to be seeing action on that? Where are we going to be seeing the ramp down of those investments in the things that are contributing to climate change as we scale up our investments in the solutions? 
Well, I mean, Canada made a commitment um, along with the, the, the rest of the G20 to phase out what are called inefficient fossil fuel subsidies by 2025. And, and the government's already eliminated eight of those and is in the process of working to eliminate the rest of them. We're actually doing a peer review with Argentina right now to actually look at each other and, and provide, uh, provide advice about what needs to be done. And, and so the commitment continues to be there. But I do think it's important in these kinds of conversations to make sure that we're clear about what fossil fuel subsidies mean. You talk to 10 people, you're gonna get 10 different definitions. Um, certainly things that incent the production um, and the exploration of, of fossil fuels, absolutely, that's a fossil fuel subsidy. If you're talking about investments that focus on how do we reduce emissions that exist within the oil and gas sector? So how do we actually uh, help with respect to technologies like carbon capture or hydrogen? or things that actually are going to improve the energy efficiency associated with, uh, with reducing emissions intensity in the sector as we move through this transition. Um, in my mind, those are not fossil fuel subsidies. That's about actually good climate policy to help us make this transition to ultimately a net zero uh, environment. So we are committed to, to eliminating fossil fuel subsidies. I would also tell you, if you look at where the bulk of fossil fuel subsidies are in Canada, and ISD does this and a number of others do, the bulk of them rest in the provinces. And so I do think there's a conversation that has to happen with the provinces about the way in which they utilize their, uh, their tax policy and those kinds of things in, in this area. Thanks, Minister. Look forward to continuing the debate with you about the definition of fossil fuel <laughs> subsidies. Um, and yes, of course, continuing those conversations with the provinces and territories about effort sharing when it comes to uh, national action on climate change. Thank you so much again for joining us today. Um, really appreciate the amazing work that continues in your department despite these uh, enormous circumstances um, and looking forward to seeing elements of that new plan in the near future. Thanks, Great. Minister. Thank you. Um, all right, folks, so as we move to our next speaker, I just want to make a um, reminder that for those of you who are joining us on Zoom, uh, translation is available. You can go to the interpretation button at the bottom right of your screen and pick which language you prefer to hear our conversation in. Unfortunately, for you, those of you watching on Facebook Live, that option is not available. We are not taking questions using the Q&A function. That is solely for logistical issues. If you would like to put a question for one of our speakers in, you can do so on our Slido link, which Nathan is sharing the link to over the Zoom chat. Um, now, I am really so pleased to be joined by High Commissioner Susan Dalgershek. Um, we heard from Minister Wilkinson, High Commissioner Susan Dalgershek, that uh, the Paris Agreement has really helped to drive Canada's climate agenda over the last number of years. In 2021, the UK has both the COP26 presidency as well as the presidency of the G7. And we know that the UK is making a big push for 2021 to be a turning point in climate ambition. Can you tell us a little bit more about that and also tell us why Canada matters in all of this? Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Catherine, for inviting me to be part of this with, uh, with both Minister Wilkinson and, uh, and National Chief Bellegarde. Um, so uh, there is nothing more important than uh, the, the, the dual aims of the chairmanship of the COP26 conference and the G7 for the UK next year. As you know, these two events come at an important time in our history where the UK's position in the world is shifting as we leave the European Union on the 31st of December. And um, we see uh, these two events as a huge opportunity for us to uh, to make a change for the better to make a difference and to provide real leadership at a moment where where it's never been more important um, and the minister referred to the covid pandemic and the possible implications of that in the climate debate and i think it's really really important that in the midst of the crisis that is currently preoccupying us all we do not lose lose sight of the bigger crisis uh, which is significantly more threatening to this planet and to every single one of us than the COVID pandemic. Um, I think the pandemic has shown that uh, when uh, the international community puts its mind to things and when it's really challenged, it can achieve incredible things. You know, getting vaccines developed uh, and, and, and now administered in the UK uh, in a space of months is something that we would all have said was impossible. And the level of international cooperation that we have seen, um, both in terms of the science 
but also in terms of the the helping hand that we are extending to other countries in order to uh, to allow them to benefit from these vaccines i think we need to harness that that same sense of urgency to the climate debate and that's what the uk is going to be doing as it chairs these two important bodies next year um, and why does canada matter well canada really matters as a country uh, with a really loud and important international voice. Canada is seen as a force for, force for good. So when Canada does things and says things, people stand up and take notice. We've already done some fantastic work with, with Canada on the Powering Pass Coal Alliance. Um, and that, that showed that when we worked together, we could really achieve a, a lot very quickly. And that, that particular alliance has, has, uh, has, has had huge benefits in terms of uh, emissions reductions. Um, and uh, I think also Canada um, uh, has, has a really important role to play in showing that you can be a, a resource exploiting country and at the same time take these issues seriously and espouse the green agenda and do the right thing in terms of climate change. So um, uh, we, uh, we don't really work more closely with any other country than, than with Canada and that's fantastic. So it's great for me to be doing it, to be pursuing this agenda here. Um, and I, for myself and my team across the country, this will be our number one priority. You know, uh, we need to make sure as we build back our economies after the COVID pandemic, we don't just go hell for leather to achieve ec economic growth at any cost. We need to make sure we don't lose sight of the climate uh, goals that we set in Paris um, um, and that we now set even more ambitious goals uh, in Glasgow next year. Um, we have an extra year to prepare for that conference, which is a good thing, um, but it means that I think the level of ambition needs to be even higher. Um, our practical level, my, uh, the High Commission in, in Ottawa uh, is doing some really uh, practical, immediate things um, which make a difference. Um, I take delivery of a brand new all-electric car when I, when I get back to Canada after Christmas. And uh, we are building a new High Commission building which will be the greenest embassy or High Commission that we have ever built anywhere in the world. And, and we think oh, wow. it's important, the minister referred to buildings, we think it's really important to show that even in such extreme climates as the one we, I was going to say enjoy, but I wouldn't say I did enjoy it, that we have in Ottawa, um, you can build properly green buildings with, with, with proper respect for the environment and, uh, and a zero carbon future. Thanks, High Commissioner. And also so important to see those kinds of examples of transition happening in buildings, in public buildings, where there are a lot of people passing through and people can really understand the ways in which that kind of um, climate action is transforming the world around them. So speaking of the UK, we have seen in recent weeks, the UK announced that it intends to increase its greenhouse gas emissions target to a reduction of 68% below um, 1990 levels by 2030. So a significant scaling up in the UK's contribution to the global effort. Um, of course, the UK has met its 2020 objectives as well. And those of us who've been working on climate accountability in Canada for years have really looked to the accountability work that was established in the UK as a leading example of what we might be able to learn from here in Canada, um, as well as other jurisdictions that have employed climate climate accountability legislation in, in recent years. Um, so can you tell us a little bit more about the kind of leadership that we're seeing coming from the UK um, and the ways in which the UK COP presidency and G7 presidency is hoping we will get that kind of scaling up of leadership from other countries? Yeah, um, so it's true, the, the, the package of measures which was announced uh, a couple of weeks ago, um, which has been called the, the 10 point plan for a green industrial revolution is incredibly ambitious. Um, but I think more importantly, uh, if we look at where we are today, we've shown it can be done. And I think it's really important that we, we can point to success stories rather than just telling people all the time you need to do more. I think it's really important to showcase the things that have worked and to explain and share that best practice. So that's one of the things that um, I think is very important about the way we, we've approached this. I think the other point, and, and the minister referred to this too, um, there has been a, a sense in the debate so far that if, if you're serious about um, challenging combating climate change, it means you have to do, do so at the expense of economic growth. Um, and I think the, the, the Prime Minister, our Prime Minister, has been very clear that that is not the case, that this is a plan which, uh, at the same time as, as setting really ambitious climate goals, will create new, new jobs, 
and will will be an impetus for real green industrial growth in the UK. And those two things are not mutually exclusive. And I think it's very important that we shift the debate away from, oh, if you want to be green, you can't have economic growth or is that it will, it will cost people their jobs. So that's one thing. Um, I think the other thing is that um, uh, we need to uh, set the bar really high. I mean, you talked about the feeling in Paris of it being, you know, for some people, a great disappointment, for some people, a huge success so it was probably about right like all those things you know if you're somewhere in the middle it's, it's probably about as good as it could get but I think this time we need to make sure that people uh, that the international community that business uh, that, that citizens understand that uh, we're, we, we're not running out of time we have run out of time and that if we don't take these sorts of measures now it's going to be too late um, and I think harnessing that, as I said earlier, the sort of energy and commitment which has been uh, unleashed by the COVID pandemic and bringing that sort of energy and passion to the debate is really, really important. It's a huge task. If we want to think about a world, of, a, a net zero world in the future, it's a massive task. Um, and we're going to need the right policies and the right incentives in place. So part of, 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 the, of the COP process will be defining and, and, and designing those sorts of policies. And as I say, sharing best practice reduction in emissions so encouraging and working with countries across the globe to make sure that they come to the conference with really ambitious targets themselves and that they don't use COVID as an excuse to shy away from their um, their responsibilities um, that we build uh, economic resilience and that any growth that we that we encourage is the right sort of growth that it's sustainable and resilient growth and the final point and this is a really important point again one to which the minister referred is to ensure that uh, in doing so, uh, we extend a helping hand, and that means money essentially, to countries less uh, economically developed than ourselves to make sure that they're not left behind and that we don't develop a sort of two tier system. Um, and the final point is to ensure that we uh, build conservation into everything that we do so that um, as well as um, reducing emissions and, and building resilience, we make sure that we don't destroy any more of our planet. And I know that in, in Canada, there is, a, there is a particular interest in that because of the fantastic bio, biodiversity that you have. And these things have, and I'm sure uh, Chief Belgard will talk about this, a particular impact on, our, on indigenous communities where that biodiversity is so important to their continued uh, resilience and their traditional ways of life. Thanks so much, High Commissioner. You touched on so much there. And in fact, one of our questions from the audience had to do with the ways in which the COVID-19 pandemic might be reshaping the COP26 agenda. So really good to hear you talk about that and, the, and how the UK presidency is thinking about pushing that conversation about ensuring that our recovery efforts are really driving the decarbonization agenda rather than bringing us backward. Um, also really want to highlight this point that you made about the decoupling of GDP from greenhouse gas emissions. And we've really seen that. I've, I've read the, the reports. We've really seen that happen in the UK um, quite dramatically over the course of the last decade. And we're still working on that here in Canada. So this notion that we can have prosperity, we can have jobs without having a greenhouse gas intensive economy um, is one that I think we can really take home here in Canada and work on. So I have one final question for you, High Commissioner. You mentioned earlier um, that it's not just about what, na what national governments are doing when it comes to implementing the Paris Agreement. Um, the success of the agreement also requires action from subnational jurisdictions, indigenous communities, cities, the private sector, academia, young people, workers. Um, so I'm curious how we can all use 2021 to bring people together around a vision of climate justice inclusion and inclusive um, clean economic growth uh, for the future. Yeah, so I think that will be a, a, a really central feature of the Glasgow conference. And I think as great as Paris was, there was still a sense that um, the big, the main action was, was happening amongst a group of people who tended to be politicians and, 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 and that there was not enough space 
uh, left for the voices of others, um, uh, particularly uh, civil society, but also indigenous groups and young people um, and business, because we won't be able to do this properly unless we have business on side with us. And there's been some fantastic leadership shown in Canada recently with your financial services sector, um, uh, some of your big investment funds signing up to, a, to a, a green agenda for the future and talking about sustainability in their own decisions. And I think, you know, this will not work if any one of those, the, the, those groups is excluded from it. So it's not just a question of having a sideshow, you know, let's invite these people along and have them in a separate room and then allow them to feed back to them. We need to make sure those voices are part of the debate all the way through. And one of the things that we're doing in Canada um, with my team is to make sure that we are engaging with all those different groups of people so uh, with young people uh, with indigenous communities um, with with subnational governments with municipal governments um, and with business um, and I think that uh, the more they are all part of the debate uh, the better the solutions will be um, it's not easy um, uh, and we have a first event uh, on Saturday uh, on the road to Glasgow which is a client which we're calling the climate ambition summit which we are jointly hosting with France and with the UN and at that as well as uh, some fairly significant political figures coming and talking about what they're doing there will be a lot of space for civil society and business to to start the debate as we get towards establishing some really ambitious goals for Glasgow. Hi Commissioner, thank you so much. Really looking forward to continuing to work with you as we move forward to COP26 in Glasgow. Hopefully we can be there in person together. Um, I know that I know that you're joining us from your home in London, so thank you so much for taking the time uh, to call in all the way from London. And uh, Thank you, it's been great. Yeah, happy you're missing the snow out here today. Uh, have a lovely day, High Commissioner, <laughs> and thank you so much again. Good thank luck. You. Thank you. All right, folks, um, this has been such a rich conversation already, and it is not yet over. So we are next going to welcome National Chief Perry Belgard from the Assembly of First Nations to join us. Um, also a reminder to folks who are joining us over Zoom, interpretation is available. You can click on the interpretation button to the bottom right of your screen and pick which language you prefer to hear our conversation in. If you have questions to ask, please click on the link to our Slido questions um, and that's where you can enter your question and vote that the, your favorite questions up. Um, and thank you so much for being with us for this really fascinating conversation. Uh, so National Chief Belgard, thank you so much for being with us today. It is such an honor. Um, let's make sure that the National Chief is indeed with us. Ah, of course, yeah, he is. <laughs> I'm here, Catherine, can you hear? I can, yes, welcome. Um, so National Chief, you have been in your position for six years today. And mm. that means that the Paris Agreement has been one of the major international treaties that has, um, you know, helped to define part of your uh, years of service. Mm -hmm. You have announced that you won't seek re-election for a new term. I would really love to hear your perspective on how the adoption of the Paris Agreement has influenced your six years, your six year term. And in the context of um, what you're thinking of in the future as you move away from this role, what role you think reconciliation, climate justice have to play with each other, particularly as we know that indigenous communities are at the forefront of the movement for climate action and are also often on the front lines of the impacts of climate change. Um, so yeah, just love to hear your initial thoughts. Well, first of all, uh, uh, Catherine, thank you so much. Nista pikskoi ne hevan apsisi. Nista ne naskamon. Nista kena naskom tino al kahki al. Nista el gankwens chenishna be kena naskom tino al. Notes me kiskau no tainans manetu kena naskom tin. Hi hi to uh, the British High Commissioner and to the Minister. No chago na naskom tino al. Just a little bit in Cree, uh, saying I'm very happy to be with you all. I'm acknowledging the Algonquin peoples because I'm on their ancestral lands here and now this place called Odawa, uh, that's where I'm, I'm speaking from. So acknowledging them and giving them thanks and uh, acknowledging the former speakers as well, the British High Commissioner, Susan Jane and Minister uh, Wilkinson, and uh, as well to give thanks to the Creator for this beautiful day. Um, yeah, it's been six years and uh, I've got six months left to go in my, my term. Uh, I was there in Paris when the, uh, the, the Paris Agreement was, was concluded. 
In fact, I was on the floor with all the prime ministers and presidents of the world when it was gaveled. And I was there with uh, Prime Minister Trudeau and Minister Catherine McKenna and um, Elizabeth May from the Green Party, uh, premiers, Premier uh, uh, from Ontario, Kathleen Wynne at that time, and, and a host of others. But there's five of us on the floor. And um, it was a very powerful moment. And, uh, and I was part of that. And uh, it was important because we were trying to educate the world about the necessity to respect the land and the waters. Um, like this crisis we're in, this COVID-19 pandemic is really, is is huge, but there is a bigger crisis that, that's still looming that we have to prepare for and deal with and get our heads around it. And as First Nations people, we've always said we're, we, we, we're stewards of the land and the waters. That's, the creator gave us that. And, and embracing our worldview because we're the, as First Nations people, indigenous people throughout the world, we're first to feel the effects of climate change. Uh, when the when the sea ice starts melting, you know when the permafrost starts melting, um, when the forests start burning up, our elders predicted these great big floods. Our elders predicted these big fires, these big winds, and how there's a transition and change, and how the world needs to start accepting our worldview, how that we're part of this environment, and and uh, in our ceremonies and our prayers, we acknowledge our worldview. I always talk about our worldview. And I want to begin with that because that's so important. If we can get our worldview as First Nations people adopted at the local level, regional level, national level, international level, I think we can start moving on uh, on policy and legislation that respects that. So we give thanks to the Creator every day, but we're part of this family. We acknowledge the gifts from Mother Earth every day. Mother Earth, Father Sky, Grandmother Moon, Grandfather Sun, our relatives, our relatives, the four-legged, the ones that fly, the ones that swim, the ones that crawl, the male plants, the female plants. We acknowledge and give thanks to all of those. The ones that sit in the east, south, west, north, those spirit beings there. And those four grandmother spirits, so important, that look after the waters, the rainwater, the fresh water, the salt water, and the power of women. When life comes, what happens? Water breaks. There's four grandmother spirits. So from a First Nations perspective, we're the two leggeds. And we say, we don't care for black, red, yellow, brown, we're, we're the two leggeds. And we have to fit into that family, that setting, that how, what I just described. And, and the, those, that worldview, if we can incorporate that locally, regionally, nationally, internationally, embrace that we've got to get better policy, better legislation in line with that worldview, I think we can make a difference. This, this, uh, Climate change piece is huge, and, and our dependency on fossil fuels is huge. Uh, we need to transition to, to gre greener, cleaner technologies sooner than later. And uh, that's what we need to do. So we need governments to work with indigenous peoples to ensure our voices are heard at the highest levels, provincially, federally, internationally, to make sure we embrace that worldview and that we can have an impact on these policies and legislations going forward. So this Paris Accord was very important. You know, all the goals that were there, but we need nation states to work with indigenous peoples to develop the national action plans and strategies going forward. Real concrete national action plans. And yes, everything from a carbon tax, investments in the clean green technologies, you know, watching the, the, the depends on how you define fossil fuel subsidies, It'll be an ongoing issue, but we need to look at all those things because uh, there is only one, one uh, mother we have, Mother Earth. There is no second one. We have to leave something for future generations. I also want to say, now I'll look to my notes now. I have four pages to read. <laughs> Great. Um, no, I'm just kidding, Kat. Um, <laughs> we have 17 minutes, so. <laughs> okay. Now, the only other one, the provinces have an important role in supporting Canada's commitment, including funding indigenous-centered climate initiatives that will help Canada achieve its goal of reducing greenhouse gas emissions by 30% of the 2005 levels by 2030. So provinces have a big role to play. We need to sit down and work with them. Respecting indigenous rights is a pathway to finding climate solutions. And of course, this includes Canada's commitments to fully implementing the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. That is huge. The global pandemic is an opportunity to push forward an ambitious clean energy agenda 
prioritizing green investments. And in a lot of these areas, First Nations are already involved. And I think of the Souk First Nation, solar, totally solar. I think of Henvey Inlet, all in wind, wind power. I think of um, the, the First Nation up north, um, Gull Bay, Chief Wilford King, microgrids. They're saving 300,000 uh, liters of diesel fuel not being burned by being on a microgrid. So things are happening in First Nations country and territory. We just need to be involved at the highest levels in order to make sure we get proper plans, proper legislation policies going forward. So I'll leave it at that. And I know there's some questions we want to get into. Yeah, for sure. Thanks so much, National Chief. I think really so, so many important um, uh, points that you've raised. I mean, first, like, so moved by the description that you offer in the role that we as two-leggeds have to play in caring for our home and the other creatures that we share it with. Um, I also really want to lift up this point that you've made that Indigenous communities across Canada and really across the world are providing so many of the solutions that we are going to need if we're going to tackle climate change in the near term. Um, I know a recent report from Indigenous Clean Energy tells us that nearly 20% of renewable energy projects in Canada are owned by Indigenous communities. And I really see that as such a critical component of Indigenous communities who um, have been subject to the resource and cultural extraction of colonialism um, can be, you know, creating means of autonomy and uh, and prosperity right there in their communities, as well as creating job opportunities in the growing clean economy for members of their community. So um, that is an incredible story that I know is happening all around the world that I don't think we get to hear very often. But there is this really critical question here of how Indigenous communities are a part of the planning process. So in 2016, the Canadian government tabled the Pan-Canadian Framework on Climate Change and Clean Growth. Um, we know that AFN and other national Indigenous organizations were invited to the table, um, although there was some question around whether you were invited to the table early, or not, early enough and whether that conversation included you in a meaningful way. And so, um, as we know, we have some more planning to do. Minister Wilkinson told us we can expect some elements of the new 2030 plan coming forward in the near future. How do Indigenous communities become part of that conversation in a way that is meaningful and respects um, right holders? Again, okay, very good question, Catherine, and, and uh, that's one of the things uh, we have to keep advocating for is to get our voices at the most senior decision-making tables. When you're talking about a, a, a national strategy or a national policy or a new piece of legislation, uh, to get our, our First Nations and Indigenous people's voices around those tables. So the involvement, the inclusion, and not just National Chief Harry Belgard, but our elder and knowledge keepers. The elders have the traditional knowledge that people need to rely on. You know, uh, it, it's, it's all about knowing the land and the waters. And from a First Nations perspective, the, their, their view, people call it modern science. Well, our people have that, but in a traditional sense, they know, you know, how things work, uh, how nature works, how things uh, fit together. And uh, that experience and that expertise has to be relied upon. You know, so uh, th the question would be, how do you get First Nations people involved? Well, you get them around those decision-making tables, our elders and our knowledge keepers around those decision-making tables and, and involve, them, involve them and include them from start to finish on any major strategy going forward. And, and that's a message to the provinces as well. You know, it'd be great to see an elders advisory council on climate change at the most senior levels. Um, and, and that's something we can keep advocating for. I would uh, use the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples as a model for full implementation. It's not just a mere aspirational document. You know, the rights and title holders uh, have to be involved and included in, in everything. Yeah. And we always say, as First Nations people, we, if we're included, we'll find that sweet spot between the environment and the economy. Sustainable economic development is key words. And so I would, that's how I'd answer that. We need to be fully involved and fully included from start to finish on any and any any major strategy going forward. Thanks, National Chief. You also mentioned in your opening comments that um, 
you know, we are in the space where there have been tremendous investments in fossil fuel production in Canada. Many of those investments have directly impacted Indigenous communities in this country. Um, we know, we've, we've heard that there are investments being made in a clean economy, but we haven't really heard that we're, you know, we haven't heard that explicit commitment to moving away from a greenhouse gas intensive and fossil fuel intensive economy. Mm. Um, and so I'm wondering if you think, do you feel we might need that kind of uh, explicit acknowledgement of the direction that we're heading in um, and what it is that we kind of need to, to be leaving behind in order to make sure that we are taking care of people and providing the right opportunities as that transition takes place over time. Mm -hmm. I think we all, all um, agree that globally we're all too dependent on fossil fuels. And, and I think it's always been said by leaders that we need to transition and we need to transition fast because we can't just turn the tab off. You know, we have to be realistic as well. I like the idea of electric cars, no question. You know, uh, retrofitting homes and big buildings, you know, strat all these things can happen, but it's phased in. It's phased in. We need to begin that plan sooner than later. And uh, we need to as well hear strongly from federal governments, provincial governments and the private sector that this is doable and this is happening. Like even in the oil and gas sector, there's a lot of jobs for cleanup of those abandoned wells. Like, so there are employment opportunities. Uh, we just have to be strategic, but start communicating that more effectively as well. Because we hear like, it's not one or the other, you know, it's transitioning because we need to make sure that there's a plan in place sooner than later. So there's something left for our children and grandchildren and those generations yet unborn. As I said before, like, we see the big fires, the big floods, the big winds. Something is happening in the environment. And our elders have, have seen this and they've, they've cautioned us. They've, they've said this is happening. And uh, they're saying, again, to respect uh, Mother Earth. You know, like they, 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 they get scared. They use this analogy, how, how our lakes and waters and streams give life to Mother Earth, just like our veins and our bodies give, give life to our bodies if they plug up. Mother Earth dies, and the same with our bodies. So there's so many analogies uh, that can happen. So we've got to transition sooner than later, but as well be realistic, you know, because a lot of First Nations are into oil and gas, you know, developments too. So as First Nations, we have 634 across Canada. Some are involved in the industry. Some are moving towards those clean energies because there's a lot of jobs and employment opportunity and wealth creation there as well. So the message will be involvement, inclusion, Transition, transition sooner as, and show the plan and communicate that because that will provide some hope that things aren't all doom and gloom. We have to provide some light at the end of the tunnel here. Thanks, National Chief. I particularly appreciate your point around planning, how necessary it is that we actually put a plan in place, execute it, make sure that we are taking care of people and communities as that plan is laid out. Um, and that's something that I think we're seeing pop up in some jurisdictions. You know, we saw Denmark recently announce that they would be uh, ending fossil fuel extraction over the next couple of decades and, uh, and lay out a plan for what that means for their workers and communities. Um, so I have a couple more questions for you. Um, first, I'm curious about uh, the um, role that you think Indigenous peoples will play as we head into COP26. So we mm. saw the Assembly of First Nations play a real leadership role in landing the Indigenous peoples and local communities knowledge platform, which is a platform that, that seeks to bring in the traditional knowledge that you spoke about earlier into the UN um, climate change decision-making framework. Uh, and so given that, I'm curious what you're expecting to see from COP26 and the ways in which you're expecting Indigenous communities to engage. Um, and I see that that High Commissioner Dalgershek is still with us. So if you would like to pop in after um, National Chief uh, answers that and, and give a little bit persp of perspective on how the COP26 presidency is thinking about incorporating that platform, I'd love to hear it. Um, but National Chief first. Well, I, I think as we prepare for any um, uh, international movement, because again, this is not only a, a domestic nation state issue, climate change, climate change knows no borders. You know, it's, it's almost like a lot of people are saying it's climate, climate catastrophe, and it's throughout the world. So we need all heads of state, all nations to collaborate together and work together and, 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 and make sure from a First Nations perspective, Indigenous peoples are involved. So for COP26, I would hope that there's full involvement, the inclusion at the most senior levels. 
uh, I would love to see an elders knowledge table from indigenous peoples from throughout the world. And indigenous knowledge keepers are the Maori from, from New Zealand, you know, indigenous peoples uh, from Central uh, South America, you know, like from North America, like if there was an international indigenous advisory council it would be huge, you know, and to have that message, uh, okay, this is in the public sector, I'll call the government's heads of state public sector, but as well, we need the, the private sector as well, you know, to get this and, and, and have involvement in the inclusion because uh, their business planning models now have to, to look at the risks involved with continuing, uh, whether it's in the fossil fuel, fuel, fuel movement or the oil and gas sector or transitioning to the clean energy, solar, wind, geothermal, uh, the business planning model. So the, the private sector has a huge role to play as well, in addition to nation states. And, and I think the, the business planning model, and, I, and I've used this line before and others have used it before, it's not all about profit now. So it's the three Ps they got to incorporate. Planet, people, profit. You know, it, it's, you got to incorporate those three Ps into your business planning model because this is too huge to put to the side anymore. And, and so from the public sector, the private sector, getting ready for COP26, I would hope and envision that there's full involvement in the inclusion of indigenous knowledge keepers and elders council, uh, leaders from throughout the world. And I would hope there's a strong commitment from the nation states for the full implementation of the UN Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. It's one thing to adopt this throughout the United Nations, that declaration, but what are nation states doing to give it life within their nation state? And I'll lift up Canada, they've introduced Bill C-15 and I'm still working towards those words, royal assent on that. But what are the other nation states doing? So that would, those are my thoughts on that. Absolutely. All right, one more question for you, National Chief. So um, I, all, I first just wanna acknowledge that last year we saw um, the declaration of a First Nations climate emergency. And that I think was a really um, strong and profound call to action from First Nations and indigenous communities in Canada to address the climate emergency. And you know, lines up with calls that we've seen from medical professionals declaring climate a health emergency in Canada and really calling on the governments to step up to the plate with ambition. We have seen some announcements recently. So in our, uh, in our Slido questions, someone's asking if you can say a little bit more about the net zero bill and how indigenous people should be involved in the implementation of that legislation. Well, again, with the, with the net zero bill, like I've always talked about uh, the necessity with, with any new policy framework, are we involved and are we included? With any new piece of legislation, how are we involved? How are we included? How is the indigenous rights lens used? Any new piece of legislation, policy, or, or, or uh, piece of legislation going forward, use it through an indigenous rights holder's lens. You know, use it, put, a, put the UN Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous Peoples lens on it and the impacts on the rights and title holders. And that legislation, even if you have a piece of legislation, um, the action plan to reach that, there's got to be very clear specific goals. And as indigenous peoples, we want to see that part of it, that action. We want to see that. And what happens if you don't meet it? What are the reper repercussions? Like there's so many questions with that piece. It's being talked about and, and you do need legislation. But again, make sure that it has that lens from a First Nations perspective utilized on it so that the rights and title holders rights are not infringed upon. And, and make sure that it's utilized in such a way that we're involved and included, uh, because again, this is too important uh, to be left to the side. So in terms of that piece of legislation, uh, the involvement, the inclusion, you, I sound like a broken record, but that's so necessary, right? To get a good piece of legislation going forward, and then the national action plan to meet those targets and goals. Uh, and, and, and the proper investments as well, because you need investments in the right sectors, in the right areas, in order to bring about that change. So there's some quick comments on that. Thanks, National Chief. Yeah, we need those investments, we need that plan, and we need that accountability for sure. Um, those are all the questions that we have for you. Again, thank you so, so much for joining us and taking the time. Um, this has been an incredible conversation. Really want to send my thanks to you, National Chief 
Belgard, to High Commissioner Dalgershek, and to Minister Wilkinson for joining us for this conversation today. Um, we know that Canada can and must do more when it comes to uh, driving our emissions down and making sure that we're investing in our communities here at home and communities abroad as we work to tackle climate change, transition to a clean economy, and adapt to the devastating impacts that we are already facing from climate um, from climate changes. Uh, thank you so much to everyone. I want to sh send a special shout out to my team at Climate Action Hour Canada for making this event happen, in particular to Eddie Perez, um, who was the one who was able to wrangle all of the speakers. And I want to say, as we look forward to Saturday and celebrating the fifth anniversary of the Paris Agreement, um, that it is a moment for us to take pause to reflect on the ways in which we have seen some transformational shifts in the last five years since the signing of the Paris Agreement uh, when it comes to climate being a key pillar of multilateralism around the world, um, of trade agreements, of uh, the priorities of the private sector, and indeed of the policy priorities of nations worldwide. Um, but of course, there is a tremendous amount of work left to be done. And Canada has a key role to play. You've heard it. Our role to play has been played. You've heard it. On each person of our panel, we have to present. It's important for us, who we call us, who around the world are looking for that international leadership. So I'm looking forward to continuing to work with all of you as we see some new levels of ambition come from our country. Bye, everyone.